Deep beneath Metropolis, Gene Hackman's Lex Luthor is hatching his real estate plan. There are complaints that he's just not diabolical enough and his evilness is diluted by his comedic sidekick, Otis, right down to the doofus music that accompanies him. The greatest criminal mind of our time, and he's hanging out with a wanted criminal wearing the loudest suit imaginable, who's stealing candy bars. But at least Hackman addresses that very question in the film. Why is the most brilliantly diabolical leader of our time surrounding himself with total nincompoops? I'm Why? back, Mr. Luthor. Yes, I was uh, just talking about you. I mean, the simple answer is comedy relief. I've always loved Hackman, and I think he does a good job and is really fun to watch when he shows up. And he's about as sinister as needed, especially when he's handing Superman a necklace of kryptonite. I kind of dig his underground train station lair, too. The whole plan of creating the earthquake, stealing the missiles, and creating Costa del X, some say is over the top. And while I can see their point, and these scenes take the film into detours of silliness, it quickly gets back on track and gets back to the suspense of Superman having to deal with this huge threat. I guess you can't take it too seriously, and it never really bothered me. Mitch Tessbrook! Yes, Lex? It's the Miss Tessmacher role that has confused me the most. I would initially assume this hot babe walking around in these sexy outfits is Lex's gal that he's sleeping with. But then why would he always refer to her as Miss Tessmacher? Is it his way of like keeping things businesslike or? Oh. Get away, get away, get away! The whole earthquake sequence with Superman flying around and having his hands full is a fun one. As soon as he saves one thing from disaster, something else happens, and he's never able to catch his breath. It also keeps with the popular tradition of famous structures being destroyed in movies. The scene where Supes discovers Lois, who he wasn't able to save, is a powerful one, mainly due to Reeves' performance. He really looks like he's in pain and is about to go off the deep end. I always find it funny when people complain about how it's so stupid that no one can tell Clark is Superman. What, just because he's wearing glasses? That's not much of a disguise. Come on. But I mean, if you're not going to accept that little part, then you might as well forget it altogether. I mean, that's the way the character's always been. I mean, in reality, of course someone would recognize him. I mean, think about it. Superman would be the most studied and analyzed being in existence. And here he is working at a newspaper surrounded by nosy reporters. Yeah, a pair of glasses wouldn't keep a secret for too long. But if you can accept an alien coming down in a rocket ship, living here among us, in his spare time flying around saving people, but the glasses disguise is where you have to draw the line, well, I mean, I just can't help you. But keeping with that nitpicky theme, here are some things that I've wondered about. Like how Clark's clothes just vanish when he's in the revolving doors or falling out the window. I mean, they just disappear around him. I mean, if they're just going to disappear, then why does he bother ripping open the shirt? Thank you. Um, should we get started with the interview? Superman is sitting down for an exclusive interview with Lois, at which point he reveals to her about his trouble with seeing through lead. Oh, you see, I, uh, I sort of have a problem with seeing through lead. Oh, that's interesting. I always thought that might not be something he'd want the world to read about considering he's about to take on all these criminals and all. Instead of trying to hide his age, which he's very conscious of, I would think him describing his weaknesses might be a little more important, and he would ask Lois to, hey, maybe you might not want to include that in the article. Far exceed those of mortal. It is forbidden for you to interfere with human history. Okay, so Superman reverses the world, thus turning back time. Now he has time to stop both missiles from hitting their targets, Hackensack, New Jersey, and the San Andreas Fault. There's no cataclysmic earthquake, Lois doesn't die, the train doesn't need saving, the school bus on the Golden Gate Bridge will never encounter any problems, and the Hoover Dam is in one piece. So if that's the case, why in the end, after Superman reverses all this and he meets up with Lois, she says, You know what happened to me while you were off flying around? I was almost in an earthquake, I had this gas station blow up beside my car, there's telephone poles falling all over the road. Huh? The gas station explosion and the telephone poles, that all happened because of an earthquake. I mean, just listen to the announcer on the radio. The San Andreas California is suffering a major earthquake. 
So I guess there was some kind of earthquake. Maybe just one that wasn't caused by Lex's missiles, but just like some random one. A minor tremor that just happened to blow up the gas station and knock down the telephone poles. Plus, right when Superman and Lois are about to kiss, we see Jimmy Olsen come running up and say this. Thanks a lot, Superman. Put me on a road in the middle of nowhere during an earthquake. No food, no water, snakes everywhere. What? So if the dam was never damaged due to the earthquake that Superman prevented from happening, then Jimmy wouldn't have been hanging off it and wouldn't have needed saving, right? I mean, I just don't get that. Unless Superman just saw Jimmy hanging out on the dam taking pictures and, you know, just for a goof decide to pick him up and drop him in the middle of the desert anyway. That doesn't sound like him, though. These inconsistencies are probably due to the behind-the-scenes changing of the story. The original ending was to have been different, with Supes just saving Lois, and the reversing the world idea was to have been used at the end of the sequel, which was being filmed at the same time. Richard Donner was originally set to direct both the first and second one. Even though he filmed the majority of both films, he ended up being fired before he finished, and the remainder of Superman 2 was directed by Richard Lester, and that resulted in changes from what Donner originally had planned. There are so many different versions of the first film with scenes that are cut or reinserted that I honestly can't keep them all straight. Still, with some minor quibbles, Superman is still a great movie. It's one I've watched countless times when I was little when it was shown on TV. So much so that at one point I was convinced that Lois showed up at the end of Lex's beach backdrop film. This was before I was able to pause it or freeze frame it and realize, oh, it's not her. I mean, it's going to continue to be one of those films I'll revisit again and again. More than 30 years later, this film still holds up. But I think the legacy for it has barely begun. I think it's one of those classic fantasy films like The Wizard of Oz or King Kong. One of those unique films that future audiences are still going to be watching and being entertained by. It's going to be discovered by countless generations of movie fans. Richard Donner was gone, but this Superman story was going to continue. Luckily, someone thought, hey, we're filming a Superman movie. Let's do another one while we're all here. So the entire cast would come back, and audiences would get a payoff to the first few minutes of this film, with those three Kryptonian criminals in black pajamas. Otisburg? It's a little bitty place. Otisburg?